two, one, and go. Hello. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the sixth um, in the series of our um, sessions um, in the course, Miami, Be Miami Urban Studies, uh, Miami, Do You Love Me? Um, uh, this is, of course, part of the Doctor of Design program at Florida International University, FIU, that's uh, just started in January. Um, and the purpose of this course, in fact, I should say that we should be in Miami right now. The intention behind the course is to have these short residential workshops in Miami or Miami Beach itself um, at our MBUS facility, our Miami Beach Urban Studies facility. And uh, unfortunately, of course, we can't be doing it at the moment this year. Um, so we're having an online course instead, but we look forward next year to being in Miami Beach because this is a particularly gorgeous time of the year to be in Miami. The purpose of the series really is to is to really narrate an alternative um, uh, understanding of, of Miami and Miami Beach, um, looking at the, the, the other side of things, let's say the B side, uh, drawing out some of the more interesting, arcane and bizarre uh, and, and colorful um, aspects of, of, of Miami Beach. We started off, of course, um, with uh, Zaha Hadid, who owned an apartment on Miami Beach, who was central um, to, to life in Miami Beach, and who was a good friend of our speaker today, Dr. Shin Fu. Um, I guess what I would say about Miami is really is that it's a very unusual space. Uh, and a city, a town, a, a, a beach is nothing without its inhabitants. And its inhabitants are crucial to understanding how it operates. And many of the sort of colorful characters of uh, in Miami um, have lent Miami a, a kind of a sense of what a gloss to what it is itself. Today, we'll be looking at uh, the, case, the case of Gianni Versace, um, the Italian uh, a fashion designer and fashion icon who established his own villa, his own um, uh, palace, as it were, on, on Miami Beach. And in so doing, started a trend or established a trend of, of doing up the old properties. He brought his, his, his uh, statues from Italy and he made it his, in many ways, his, his home from home. Um, tragically, of course, he was murdered outside the door of that uh, the park, of that, of that um, uh, property uh, in 1997. Um, the story about his his death and his life and his death has, of course, been the subject to of a couple of, uh, of, of 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 movies and and so on. It's been it's full of intrigue and mystery, um, and much of it hasn't been disclosed. Um, today uh, we are going to be welcoming uh, Dr. Shin Fu, who is in a perfect position really to comment on this really um, bizarre but fascinating um, uh, story. I should start by saying that Shin Fu was brought up in the hallowed academic environments of Beijing University, commonly known as Beida, Beijing, da, Beijing da Shu, the leading university along with maybe Xinhua, which is right next door to it uh, in, in China. Being brought up in, 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 uh, in Beida in those times, that was not so easy uh, with various sort of political um, events happening, uh, the Gang of Four and so on. It wasn't so easy to be an academic in China. And, and uh, Xin Fu herself studied at Beida um, at a time that coincided with the most dramatic event, the Tiananmen Square event of, of uh, 1989. In fact, one of her classmates was what the leader of the, the student uh, movement there. Partly as a result of, of those events, uh, she then found herself leaving China and going to uh, study in, in Italy. Um, Fu Xin, which is the Chinese way of saying Xin Fu, uh, means Renaissance, and the city that she went to first of all, she chose to go to, was Florence, um, where the Renaissance itself uh, began. Uh, subsequently, she shifted to Bologna. Uh, Bologna, of course, is famous not only as the, the culinary capital of Italy, but also as a place where famously the Corpus Juris Civilis, the body of uh, European civil law, was rediscovered, and it became a centre of law um, uh, throughout the world in many ways. And in fact, Alberti, our famous on whom I worked myself, initially studied at law in Bologna. Um, while she was in Italy, she became part of the um, increasingly exotic fashion culture. Um, herself a model, she was there to witness the kind of the era of supermodels, um, uh, and about which we'll no doubt hear a lot um, fairly soon. Um, uh, and she also became a correspondent. Um, she uh, reported back to China, introduced China in many ways to the glamorous world of the Italian fashion scene. Um, subsequent to that, uh, she traveled to London, um, where she 
uh, started studying at the at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, which is very, very close to the Architectural Association and the Bartlett School of Architecture, two famous institutes for architecture. Um, there she, she studied for a master's program and subsequently moved to Oxford, um, where she took a, a, a PhD, a, a, a DPhil, sorry, Doctor of Philosophy in um, Gender Studies and Fashion, um, a very kind of pioneering work, which really in many ways uh, reflects her own her own life. Um, and since then, she's moved to Miami. Uh, she has opened up uh, art galleries in uh, New York and Shanghai and also in Miami. And she's one of the, the central characters who um, kind of is based in Miami much of the year and who makes Miami so special. She was, of course, uh, as one could imagine, part of that uh, circle of Zaha Hadid when she was living in Miami. I wanted to just to, to before in, before handing over to Shinfu to um, say just a few words about uh, Miami for those of you unfamiliar with the kind of the the culture of, of Miami. I mean, one of the things that becomes becomes oh sorry I'm I've, I might have secrets. Um, what are the, I'm sorry I've missed my okay. Um, I'll go. I, I won't talk about it now. Um, so, one of the things I'd say about about Miami is that there's the culture of um, what we call uh, snow snowbirds of individuals who come and um, uh, uh, who um, make it sort of part of the uh, who become part of the scene itself. Uh, but no, they come they come in the summer months to escape from the winter climb, especially from Canada. What I would suggest, though, there is also uh, there's another sort of way of thinking about this as these individuals and often some of them very colorful characters like Zaha also contribute to the story of, um, of, uh, of, 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 of Miami Beach. They enrich the culture, as it were, of these things. And so Shinfu, I see almost as a kind of like a, a Marco Polo figure um, within this uh, culture. She um, is uh, um, like she is kind of coming to Italy at the same time, bringing back some things from Italy. And what I find interesting about the figure of Marco Polo himself is the way in which um, he uh, <clears throat> it was a kind of part of a two-way process. It wasn't just him going from Italy to China. We take the, the story about pasta. No one quite knows whether pasta came from China and went to Italy or came from Italy and went to China. And that's the kind of the, the incredible sort of world of crossover, of cross-pollination out of which um, Shin is, is, is emerging. For some reason, Shin, I'm going to hand over to you now. I've, my slides seem to be out of order and I'm a bit, bit nervous. Can I just unshare a second to make sure I've got the right, the right, right one? Give me a second. Oh, yes, I do have the right ones. Uh, let me just, I want to, sorry, I want to, let me share again. I wanted to um, um, just briefly, um, Briefly, I mean, just to dwell on that question about uh, uh, about uh, um, Marco uh, about uh, Marco Polo. I, you know, I think this is a kind of intriguing figure. And myself, I've been part of this kind of interaction between the East and the West. Um, but Shin was, in many ways, a pioneer, um, uh, really been responsible for opening up a sort of dialogue between the world of fashion of, of, of Italy and Milan and the world of China. The way that I often sort of like to think about uh, this. Uh, Oops, sorry, one second. Um, the way that I like to think about this um, uh, process is, or the way one way of describing it is thinking of it in terms of uh, the discussion that Deleuze and Guattari has about the wasp and the orchid, um, whereby he talk, speaks about a kind of certain mutualism that you find in nature. Um, the, the wasp is kind of, of course, interested in the orchid because the orchid has plenty of nectar. But what happens with the with the with the orchid is a kind of process whereby the orchid becomes the, the wasp and the wasp becomes the orchid. Indeed, the orchid feeds the the or helps the the, the wasp in some in the what orchid in some way. Because what happens is as the the wasp is gorging itself on the nectar there, the pollen um, is deposited onto the back of the wasp, and uh, and of course eventually after a certain moment of time, um, the wasp. Has consumed the nectar and flies on to the next orchid. But in that process, in that process, there is a kind of astonishing um, uh, moment whereby uh, it is the kind of cross pollination um, between these different things. It's not a one way process at all. And the way that I would sort of understand that the presence of people like Jenny Versace or indeed Zaha in a place like Mami Beach or indeed Shinfu is a kind of process whereby 
they bring to Miami something very special. Um, they make Miami Beach what it is. It's not just simply a question of taking, it's a kind of cross-fertilization of, um, uh, of, of, of two different processes. And, and Shin, I would say, when we were trying to, to put a poster together, we were wondering where to we, what address, what place, what city to give for her, because she spends her time um, between Miami, Paris, uh, sorry, Miami, New York, London, and California, um, and in many ways represents that sort of, uh, that very colorful, dramatic um, uh, life of these uh, very rich cultural figures who kind of, like a butterfly in some ways, descend, or maybe I'm mixing my metaphors, descend on Miami Beach to make it the place that it is. And of course, uh, we wouldn't, without those individuals, we wouldn't have the, the extraordinary restaurants, bars, and hotels of the space itself. So I wanted to sort of suggest that, that, that what's happening with, with individuals like Shin Fu, these pioneers who are, who are making steps up these connections, they are themselves Miami Beach. A city is nothing without its inhabitants, and we need to think about those individuals themselves. Um, I want to just... Um, uh, before I just move on, Shin, I want to just check that I've, I haven't got any music on the next piece because I've got the, the video next. Um, uh, and we had a problem last week when we um, we lost our video because it was... Um, um... Thank you, Neil, for the introduction. Actually, uh, Johnny Basach gave an interview in the Vanity Fair saying, I'm a little like Marco Polo, going around and mixing culture. And... and, and uh, but such, you know, describe himself as a Marco Polo in the fashion world. And I, I remember I give an interview about myself in Shanghai. They said, so we, you know, what is your gallery, Fuxing Gallery about? Beside the Fuxing in Chinese means Renaissance. Then I thought, well, I think I'm a Marco Polo, uh, which Polo means masculine and uh, Polo is uh, feminine. So I think that Marco Polo is, has been always, you know, and uh, in, in, in the international uh, uh, cultured iconic figure for someone who like a like a gypsy like a tribe you go around the world you you feel home anywhere because you are you know I I just mentioned to uh, uh, Theo, Theodore about I miss London I miss Bologna I, I miss I miss Paris so much during this year but I feel home in Miami because I can't travel but I make my own home in through all this experience I'm going to share. So let's start. <laughs> yeah. Did, sorry, did I, I, I just, I think I pressed it by mistake. Um, okay, let's start. So let's just begin this one again. I'm sorry. Can you see it? No, I see you. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. This is, I've, I've made a mistake. Let me just go and get back onto the, the thing. Oh, excuse me. Um, are we going to start with the fashion? fashion? Yes, we are. We are. Okay. Is no music right? Is yes, no I took the music off, sorry. Okay, so I could talk. So yes. this, I start with a last fashion show, The Runway of Sunny Versace, just a few months uh, before he was killed on the steps of his, uh, you know, mansion Versace. That was, this was the last collection I, and last show ever for Johnny Versace. So I would like to, for everybody to remember the moment that's in the Ritz Hotel in Paris and the style is exactly what uh, the, you know, sublime, the uh, essence of Versace uh, uh, fashion. You can see now the, the, the leather uh, 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 black dress in the Chinese or Japanese, uh, uh, you know, the writings and the Bright colors, yellow, the crowds, the, the Greek Orthodox crowds. So during this fashion show, um, the, the video, I would like to give the three um, characteristic of Gianni Versace, the fashion as in the, in the history of the fashion. First, he created the supermodel. Look, this is Naomi Campbell. And then you will see um like linda evangelista and you could see um christy turlington so all this the supermodel that you know never exist you know when we start modeling in in milan in the 1990s you paid for that still have you know no euro yet you pay like a, a, a you know it's just like 
it's a kind of a job for young girls, nothing important. And the supermodel is the first time ever in the 90s quit this, these models pay at that time is ten thousand dollars per hour. So this is like incredible, you know, to put the supermodel as kind of a celebrity in the in 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 the stage, which I think it really. And then afterwards, the follow on you know, the supermodel. Of course, behind the supermodel is a marketing concept that promote the the Versace fashion. The second, the, the fashion of massage is the celebrities. You can see on the front row, you can see Anna Winter, you can see Madonna, you could see Hatton John, you could see uh, Prince Diana. So he was the first ever, the fashion designer really understand the power of the celebrity sit at the front row and the red carpet. And in the 1987, the earliest um, the fashion show. So that was genius. And then never, you know, fashion designer is considered art artist. In Italy, is almost like artisan, artigiani. But this first time, he, he became the Andy Warhol of the fashion world and brewing this marketing, using the image of celebrities and also the present of the celebrities in his fashion. Last one, uh, before I have a, you know, the slides on, I would like to say the last one is that he's Italian and he was born in Reggio Calabria. You know, Reggio Calabria, um, it's a southern Italy. You know, being in Italy, people consider Reggio Calabria a una provincia o regione molto povera. It's like a poor, it doesn't matter. But because this region is very just in front of Sicily. So it's, a, it's that region we call the Magna Greca. You know, it's considered like Greek. You know, it's a Greek town, it's a Greek city. So Johnny Versace grew up in the Greek temple ruins, the Roman, you know, the, the, the you know, archaeology site. So he had a passion for art, for, for the archaeology, for the ancient, you know, the, the cultures. So he blend, infused the first time ever in as a fashion designer. It's not just a tailor, but he fused with art. That's why I, I'm very interested. I write, you know, dissertation art, articles about the Caravaggio in, uh, in, uh, in Gianni Versace, and the war with Versace. So this kind of combined the art history, culture with the fashion as never happened before. So that was the three and legacy I think still remain today. Neil, could you stop the video and we go to the slides? Okay, so uh, we go ahead through the slide. This is the first part of my presentation is Gianni Versace. So this is the famous Gang of Four in the fashion world in the 90s. We call them Gang of Four. It's like, you know, it's like trying to say Gang of Four. In, and now it's the Gang of Four of the fashion world. They are the top, top supermodel. And from these four girls, they start, the, the model become the most desirable and dreaming job for all the beautiful girls. And I was there in 1990. Two, you know, I, I'm a, I'm working for another really super brand. I'm working for Tursadi, uh, uh, Gianfranco Ferrade. I love the white shirts. I like um, uh, Bibelos, which you know, it's 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 a young and and Armani and but but Gianni Versace definitely um, created his own this opulence and uh, and this, it dressed to cue and shocking and the colors and they call it it's like um and like with uh, greek motifs with a tuscan designs with all these roman uh, um, backgrounds so it is really at the beginning of the supermodel go ahead and that is with and grow oh bigger and bigger. You can see Claudia Schiffer. You could see um, uh, which friend of mine also that we, we met uh, like um, um, how to say Carlo Bologna as well. And actually, Carlo Bologna uh, was discovered by Gianni Versace. You know, he, 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 she still he went to the funeral and she gave an interview saying, 
um, you know, without Johnny Basaji, I would be a, just a, a, a little shy girl or try to make some songs. So go ahead. And that's the, the pictures and also the supermodel, the gown of four and black white. That's the, 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 you know, with Anton John, he's very much into music. He's the first time as a fashion designer, he, he really involved the, the, you know, like MTV, the music videos, and he designed all the, the costume for, uh, for Anton John, the, a tour around the world. He, he really bring the fashion show, not only for five seconds, but into a really world stage. So, you know, normally you see a fashion run, and if I walk in a runway, it, it may be just, I walk for, uh, for two hours with the makeup things, actually it's two minutes, maybe even less, one minute. Old. But Johnny Versace, <clears throat> no, he blended well and using this, the novelty of the music video, MTV at that time. And I think the famous show is that it's the, in the 19, I think it's 87, that the four girls came out with the, with the Versace runway, but with the music of uh, Michael George, the British singers, the newly uh, uh, video, uh, 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 music video together at the same time. So that was really a kind of a, a you know, Sessional in, in a fashion world that rock and roll on the runway. And that is the most famous dress ever by a, a Liz, Liz, um, a, what's the name? Liz Taylor? It, it's an actress, British actress. And, um, and she uh, went to the reopening for the, I think the four, wedding, four weddings and the one funeral. And at that time she was not, you know, she, she was a model, but the British model at that time is not very well paid. So she could afford uh, a really a close to go to a pick daily and a lesser square for the opening. So she called a friend of the assistant of Johnny Vassar and said, look, I need a close. And that time, all a Johnny Versace, you know, this art couture, all um, rent out or sold out. There's only this piece left. And um, she said, okay, you know, this is the last one I wear. And this become the most show picture ever in history. This, this golden large pin, you know, of the dress. And, and sometimes, and let's uh, joke about it, said that if, if I, have never wear this clothes. I might have a more serious role. So it's really a scandalized and uh, it, it, you know, make Johnny Versace definitely a known in the entertainment world. Yeah, it's, it's Liz Hurley and it's uh, Hugh Grant with who's her partner. Yes. Yeah, it is Hurley. Yes, exactly. That time they are boyfriend and girlfriend that time. And before the famous, uh, 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 you know, the. Sun, uh, I think it's a Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, something happened. <laughs> so, but at that time, they're still a couple. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, that's what I just mentioned, you know, it's the, definitely it's the queen in the music world in the United today and the Jennifer Lopez. And you can see all this Miami influence. That's almost like the, the final stage of uh, Johnny Vasati living Miami as, as uh, uh, Neil uh, uh, um, described. It's not just live as a guest or as a res, you know, a, a borrowed the land to be home. He absorbed the uh, local culture, the sun, the beach, the plants. So this is really new. And you can see the influence of Miami on Versace uh, 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 fashion design. That you can see that the, you know, the celebrities and, uh, and Johnny Versace was using and um, promote his art, uh, promote his fashion. In the last one is that he's, you know, he liked this uh, portrait and uh, portrait is almost like, you know, Caravaggio's uh, oil painting, you know, the, the light, the perspective. I think sometimes there is kind of a, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a curse or, or what it's, he killed his, you know, his life is like a Caravaggio and, uh, you know, killed and, um, and died in the very early, early year and uh, age of 50. So that's his, his favorite. So the first part of uh, um, uh, Johnny Versace in the fashion world and uh, end here. So 
then that was just mainly in in you know in Milan and uh, and he has a home in Lago Como and yes you know so he, he run, um, has a home in London so he travel around and but in 1992 and he came to Miami with his uh, friends family Donatella and on the way to Cuba, he stopped uh, in, in Miami. He walked around the Ocean Boulevard and he stopped in this called the Casa Casulina, which is, uh, has been uh, built in 1930s and by, um, uh, owned by a very known family owns uh, petrol oil and uh, designed by English architect. I think it's Aden Freeman. And, uh, but it's been run down, it's kind of a, they sold out to uh, become a house Amsterdam by a, a gentleman last name Amsterdam become a kind of condominium with a temperament things that by 1992 and Johnny Versace passed by and with his sister and his sister uh, gave interviews and she said you remember so well and Versace passed by 11 16 that's the uh, that's a house number 11 16 Ocean Boulevard and he looked at it and said that's mine I want it. And then, you know, at that time, all the Ocean Boulevard is a hotels, bar, restaurants, you know, it's it's really run down. It's called like the the, the waiting room of the guard. It's like, you know, it's called, uh, um, uh, you know, for the newly wed and the nearly dead. You know, it's, it's kind of things that um, it's not, not Miami Beach today. So he was the first one who took over this famous art deco design district and um, to build a home. As Neil mentioned, he, he bought all the marble from Italy. The, around the swimming pool, you saw the, 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 the first pictures and all the statues are from France. He basically bring his own Europe to this sun and beach Miami as a home. So he, he started 1992 and he lived in this house, 1997 and 15th of July, he was killed um, in front of the, just in front of the, his house on the steps by a, by a gay and um, it is named called Andrew Cochanan. And um, he, 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 he was the serial killer. He, called, he killed the four people before he arrived uh, in, uh, in Miami and he stayed in Miami for eight weeks, almost, you know, as of two months and find out, uh, you know, routines and, and aim and to find the Versace, which he met uh, Johnny Versace really briefly in San Diego in a nightclub. And that time, uh, Johnny Versace um, uh, was a kind of stage designer for the opera house of uh, um, San Francisco for uh, 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 to design, you know, he was very interesting in opera, in ballet. So, so he did a lot of beautiful uh, costume design for the stage. So he was there in San Francisco and, and then you, you know, in San Diego, he met, met uh, 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 the Andrew Cochrane briefly, but nobody really know with what happened. The family always, always, uh, you know, Donadella or Sandro Basati always denied that they never met. Uh, not, no, nothing, nobody knows about him, but by some uh, friend of uh, Andrew, you know, they definitely met um, briefly and what happened that night, nobody knows. And it's going to keep as mystery, you know, mi and a mystery uh, uh, kind of, uh, <clears throat> Um, story and nobody could really know what actually happened, but definitely there is a kind of illusion, obsession, and and uh, from Andrew Cook and then to to um, transform its frustration and his anger and his kind of a uh, you know and as. Uh, Andy Warhol said to be famous, everybody deserved to be famous in two seconds, which is he did it and he become a no even we talk about today after you know so many years and um he killed and um then he ran for almost 20 days finally and uh, he killed himself in the private boat house and that's that's the you know um now can you keep on uh, the slides please yeah that's the person and um you know um is gay and um he, he, he was born in San Diego by an uh, um, American mother and a Filipino father. And very, you know, private school, bishop, 
um, private school in San Diego, very, very, um, you know, wealthy uh, um, private school. Uh, I think he, he did all the high school graduate, but never finished college. And, and um, so that's, that's kind of a complete two. And in the Andrew uh, Kukanan is always, um, he, he was, always fascinated by by a uh, fashion world the, the vogue even in the uh, in the last place he hide and the, and the fbi agent found out next to his body is a block of the vogue fashion magazine next to him that's the, the you know the neighborhood of um, of uh, of the now the mansion and the Maison uh, Versace around this the Art Deco. We just go through the slides quickly. That's, oh, that's the, uh, um, uh, in, the in the near the, uh, the art district, um, just in front of uh, museums. So that's called 1000 Museum by Zahadid. And that's where I met Neil. <laughs> so that's the, that's the beauty. And that's the moment I met, and we had a big opening, and with uh, with the developers, and we, and and uh, we had a very nice party during the Art Basel, art, and uh, I think many years ago. Yeah, that's the that's the photography of the of the developers. They put pictures, and ever since we met, and I visited London, and we met every year during Art Basel, Design Miami, and uh, with Patrick as well. So it's, it's, yeah, so it's kind of a very, um, you know, precious memory for me. Yeah, that's the famous design in the, in the, um, in the Lincoln Road, and, and it's the garage, and I think by a very famous architect. Now become the our uh, the favorite spot for doing a yoga class. <laughs> this is a, my the like a mecca for for all the uh, old art world in the, and for doing Art Basel um, Miami. This is where Art Basel and um, took place. Unfortunately, I think last year and I don't know this year what happened, but definitely it's the destination for all the design, uh, all the designers and uh, collectors and artists or curators. Everybody want to be there in the end of uh, uh, um, November, the first week of December. It's like the hottest spot in on this planet is the Art Basel Miami, in the convention center. This is the, my second home. You know, I love classic music and I, I, you know, why not, I couldn't travel around, uh, you know, sometimes I, I stay in Miami, that's my, it's the uh, Frank Gehry's um, New World Symphony. It's just amazing with all the best uh, 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 concerts uh, could enjoy like in New York and in Paris, in London, the, the best uh, um, performance I, you know, I, I never had in Miami Beach. This is a design, you know, it is a design district and um, it, it's become really um, um, very vibrant during the, this, this period as the COVID and uh, this become more and more, not only locals, visitors, because there's not so many places you can go now. So this is a place which is really still have a, you know, possibility. And, uh, you know, we just had a very big installation art show by Louis Vuitton. And the, I think they did in Shanghai. After Shanghai, they moved to Miami and it was in the design district with a big uh, fashion uh, presentation of the uh, men collections and the uh, art uh, installations um, just finished on the, 25th of January. Quick slides about the Miami, the Ocean, Ocean Boulevard, you know, around um, in the, Miami, uh, the Versace uh, mansion. And now that it's become a, a kind of hotel, boutique hotel, and, um, you know, uh, with the restaurants and things, hopefully, you know, one day we will meet together and to visit that place. So now the Basach mentioned is private owned uh, boutique hotel and they keep everything almost original. And the restaurant is Italian Mediterranean style. It's, you can, you, you know, you don't have to be guest. You can walk in to have your lunch or have a drink. It's a really nice place just, you know, well, just uh, to visit.
Okay, this is the last slide. Oh yeah, uh, that's for the fashion. Uh, now, could you go ahead quickly? That's the, the you know the, the American crime story, and uh, you know the, I think um, in the um, I think it's by um, I, I think I saw it in the in the Netflix um, this this um, TV series quite interesting but uh, very juicy and um, yeah this if someone wants to know more about the Versace it's interesting to watch. In the end of my presentation, I would like to just, you know, start a discussion and uh, end with the logo. And it was just, um, you know, connect with my uh, title of, the, of my presentation, Medusa Raspadi. So Medusa, as you know, is a great mythology and it's, it's you know, the beautiful girl and, um, and turned into a monster and, you know, and if you look at uh, 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 her and you you just stoned and you never you never you can't look look again and um, so this kind of thing that Johnny Versace transform into a kind of you know um, kind of positive way that his fashion is so striking it's dressed to kill so once you and it, uh, uh, the um, Donatella Versace explained to uh, to the uh, to the, the the media and. Um, and the interview saying that, and her brother uh, would like to have his fashion, Versace is like a Medusa. Once uh, you, you fall in love, you can never live without. So, so that's the idea of the Medusa um, for, uh, for Gianni Versace uh, fashion house. It's a kind of addiction, a perception you can't live without, it's like a drug. And that was also in the, in, the, in the kind of pendant of the big, big logo. And it's actually Versace's logos everywhere from sunglasses to body lotions, the belt. It's just like, it really, uh, you can't miss it, you know, when you see the Medusa. And that's, uh, that's the original, the, the, the Medusa um, uh, the statues in the ancient Greek and uh, the collections are from a Metropolitan Art Museum in New York. That's the, that's the Medusa from Caravaggio. The, the sculpture, I think, is from Bellini. That's the final slides of the, the grandeur, the glamour. It is like larger than life. It's the, the Medusa logo of uh, Johnny Versace. So in the end, uh, I just saying that sometimes I think, you know, you know I'm, as Chinese and we always say, be careful what you say, the words has, has a weight and uh, the symbols has got, a, you know, at power. So in many ways that and Medusa, you know, in, in a way it's almost like sign signal the destiny of, of Versace in a way and uh, to see this two, two sides of the blades that, you know, to kill, to be killed, and to stone, and to be stoned, and um, to shock, and to be shocked. So it's, it's in a way, it's interesting. I would like to open discussion to see that how this kind of uh, you know beauty turned into danger. That you know, to success and uh, leading to the fatal tragedy, and. Uh, so how being an architect, being uh, as artist, as a creator, how you balance the way between, you know, the angel and the evil and everybody inside of us. So I would like to end my uh, presentation with a poetry about the Medusa by uh, Luis Bogan and written in 1923. Um, it, it, um, she wrote like this. I had come to the house in a cave of trees, facing a sheer sky, everything moved. A bell hung ready to strike, sun and reflection wheeled by. When the bare eyes were before me, 
and his in hair, held up at a window, seen through a door, the stiff bored eyes, the serpents on the forehead formed in the air. This is a dead scene forever now. Nothing will ever stir. The end will never brighten it more than this, nor the rain, rain blur. The water will always fall and will not fall. And the tipped bell makes no sound. The grass will always be growing for hay deep on the ground. And I shall stand here like a shadow. And the greed balanced day, my eyes on the yellow dust that was lifting in the wind and does not drift away. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, uh, I just wanted to to open up, and I think the the Medusa story is um, something intriguing. Um, but as I was saying in the beginning, I was trying to kind of argue that that uh, people coming to Miami, not just taking from Miami, they're adding to Miami. There's always a kind of, let's say, a dialectical uh, moment, shall we say, between between two opposites sometimes. And um, I often contrast the or compare, as it say, the Medusa moment when something becomes stone. Uh, to the moment when when stone becomes alive, and um, it's particularly opposite for architects because Daedalus, who was supposedly the first ever architect, was had the capacity to bring statues alive. Um, and one thinks here of the kind of the way that um, in um, uh, you see these kind of uh, what do they call them uh, 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 tableau vivant. These kind of these, uh, especially in Barcelona and things uh, you, uh, uh, down the Ramblers, you can see these kind of people posing as frozen statues and then they come alive. Um, and it's in some ways, I have to think that therefore one has to see this kind of moment of death alongside moments of life, that, that death leads to life and, and so on. Uh, uh, you know, a firework, which is an incredible moment of life, always dies and at the same time, out of death, you often get maggots feeding and growing and so on. And the other em emblem I think is kind of interesting from that point of view is um, uh, Narcissus, uh, who famously, uh, the story is that, that Narcissus Fell in love with Echo, and then was no. Echo fell in love with Narcissus, and then but uh, Narcissus spurned uh, Echo, and the, then the, then then as as punishment, he was made to fall in love with his own shadow. And of course, he famously, after a day of, of hunting, he's looking in this this pool, and and in rapture, his own as his own kind of image and so on. But he dies; he turns into stone. Um, but out of that stone, and again, this dialectical reversal. Um, something emerges that the narcissus the plant emerges from where narcissus had, had died so i always think the kind of the death and life are actually much more kind of dialectical in a way and in some senses um i i see the, i also can see the opposite actually in, in jenny versace he kind of brought life to something in a way um and certainly i think he he and Zaha in some ways realized the potential of miami that was always lying there i think that we, we had this discussion before and so too i think um art basil um when uh, Jason Chandler presented his uh, overview of the architecture of Miami, he started off with this kind of Christo um, uh, installation where one of the islands was surrounded with this, um, in very Christo style, with pink. Um, and it was, as I understand it, it was a result of that, that Art Basel then came and, and, and so on. So it's almost like Miami has again been through a kind of renaissance of its own in some senses. It's been discovered. Um, and become this kind of exotic um, space, uh, at least Miami Beach has. So let's not forget there's another side of Miami, a very poor side of Miami. Um, uh, uh, well, in fact, Miami's like the fourth poorest country in, uh, city in, in, in the States. But the, the glamorous side is something that I think has been, has has only fairly recently um, blossomed in a sense. And, and it, in some ways, to my mind, it may be, you know, it's tempting at, at first sight to somehow see Miami a bit like Las Vegas as a kind of a, a slightly uh, tawdry kind of um, uh, uh, space. Uh, and of course, Miami itself has these other histories, the histories of the kind of cocaine cowboys and goodness knows what. It's got all sorts of different sort of histories, been a melting pot of culture. But there is a particular interesting aspect to, to Miami, which um, 
uh, which I find intriguing. The the, the way in which you know, Zaha discovered Miami, um, and uh, and also I think also you're also part of this kind of story in some senses um, of these kind of uh, I don't know exotic creatures or something. But they're, where it's become this uh, extraordinary place. And um, I mean, Philippe had this kind of has this view that this maybe this is a a kind of a, a prototype for all kind of uh, cities that somehow. Um, I mean, Dubai could never quite be like Miami. Uh, and I find it interesting why Zaha came to Miami. Um, and there's a whole story. She used to go to Istanbul and so on. That Then she discovered Miami. Miami is a place where she felt perfectly at home. And she found herself kind of surrounded by uh, a, a kind of another form of global elite, some of whom were her clients and things. So there's this kind of moment, I think, that's kind of intriguing for me in the way that Miami has been kind of discovered. Uh, and there's this kind of this exotic, special, um, extraordinary Miami um, that um, you're able to enjoy right now. Um, yeah, I think you know, I would like uh, like to to um, give a kind of a three my thought of why Johnny Versace pick up Miami, and, and and maybe we can start from to see why Zaha did and why I pick up Miami. You know, it's like people it's like sometimes people want to send me catalog or or some imitation said, well she where uh, should I send, you know? And, and then many of my friends said, don't give their, your address in, in, in Miami and send in New York your address because they're more proper, more, more considered serious. <laughs> so it's really interesting how the, the, that this stereotype of Miami is kind of, a, you know, resort is, a, a, you know, a boat. And, but anyway, I think there's three ideas uh, um, I, I thought about why. Uh, Versace pick up Miami, not you know Boston, San Francisco, and um, and New York, which is you know have more museums and more fashion industry really based. You know, basically a uh, Miami fashion. We just opened Miami Fashion Institute, I think, only three years ago, and we never even had that. And uh, and uh, most of the, the 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 material you buy in the in the in the in the street orchard, you know, the little Cuban, you get a little bit of buttons and fabric. So I. I we don't have this very fertile and rich a playground for fashion designer. So I think the one reason, first of all, it I think it's weather. And ever, never before, even during the COVID, we are so and um, busy in Miami in a way that people from um, from Europe and people from New York. They even said that Governor, Governor uh, uh, Cuomo was, is the best real estate uh, promoter for Miami. So all the New Yorkers came, you know, during this year. And we have a lot of people uh, uh, from um, from California, you know, a lot of people from California that are coming to, to Miami to live and, uh, and bring all their technologies. We, uh, I was told actually um, last month that we are going to build the 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 Silicon Valley and, and the Caribbean sunshine. So we are going to do all those things and we have all these um, um, uh, preparations. So there's a weather, sun and the sea. And I, sometimes I talk to Neil about the weeks, you can jump in the ocean is like 23, 24, you know, degree of water and uh, without wetsuits, I'm surfing, diving as just, so it's really the weather. I think it's like, it's almost like animal instinct. You want to be, and when you, and the sun and the beach, you know, you're, you're almost like you're light. You're, you know, I said you and the sun. So you're happier. It's like a, uh, the, the, the research on about the happy, happiness studies. They said people live near the ocean and, and the sun are, are happier. You know, I, I think I believe that. I think there's a lot of reason, even from the basic instinct, people want to be there. there. I think for Johnny Versace being a, a little Carabia, the, the southern Italian guy, if, he felt home, the weather you're familiar with it. And, and the thing second is, in, is as Neil mentioned about this, the diversity, the international as ever in Miami that you, you if I drive or I walk on the Collins or, or uh, Lincoln Road, you can hear any language, 
any from Hebrew, you know, basically like, you know, next to Miami Beach is almost like little Tel Aviv, you know, there's a lot of Jewish communities and things. And then, of course, there's Europeans and, you know, Italian took over all the hotels, restaurant business, French in the hotel management and Swiss and English. So we are really, really a, a European, it's close to Europe. You know, we, we, we fly for five hours, you will be in Lisbon, in Madrid, you know, for me, it's it's such a heaven for me. Jump the plane in the in the Miami International Airport. I will be in in Milan in five hours or, or in Madrid. So it's really kind of closeness to Europe. Europe. It's make people feel feel kind of ease to move to to um to Miami. And of course, the, the this this city is built on the swamp. You know, it's it it's almost like a big hotel. Check in, check out. It's kind of a even I could say use a loose, but same time it's really very fluid. So you are not have this. Oh, I'm going to leave Miami the rest of my life. I have to find my my roots. You no, know, people are, are, are in the mood of, of almost like a weave into it. It's a weaving into the fabric of the of the city. You you are you are the thread. You move in. You can take out. So this kind of easiness for all the newcomers from no matter if you're the big big uh, celebrity of designers or you are the you are the tennis player from you know from Switzerland or you are the soccer soccer player if from Argentina you all here and and there is sense of uh, and the sun the beach almost like you you know you don't have all this dress up cold fur you know you are t-shirt you are shorts so it's really more kind of naked the truth make you feel like okay you know even you have a bitterness you only wear t-shirt you, you flip-flop so there is kind of lifestyle make people feel easy to insert into into the city and without to really to have a heavy statement who i am what i'm doing no it's it's here it's it's a weave weaving city Last one I think is about the Mapasachi. You know, I think it is a kind of tolerance because it's a really large gay community and um, beside San Francisco. So here as a, a Vasachi uh, 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 give interviews and he said, look, you know, he looked quite a kind of a Southern it Italian guy, you know, dark skin, black hair. So he, he really can blend almost disappeared among all the Latinos. He feel he's not be really like right away to see Johnny Versace in the middle of the, the peak daily circles, you know, I, I think that this is more he feel in, in his own world in the, and also being speak Italian and Spanish, you know, it's it's really I, I speak perfect Italian. But for me in Miami, it's one of the choice I feel quickly to pick up Spanish. And understand their conversations. I don't feel like I lost. So I think there's three reasons I think for for Versace really, uh, uh, um, you know, decide to build a house. And of course, unfortunately, he he end up his life here. But it is really sad. But in that way, I can see there's so many people like uh, uh, um, Versace and and from Europe from. Uh, from you know, not too much Asian yet, you know it, and uh, but uh, Europeans and um, and even from other states in the United States are um, moving to um, to Miami um, before and ever now is so many here in Miami. No, I think that's a beautiful description of uh, of what Miami is, and I just I'm just wondering to what extent the whole. Um, kind of aesthetics. I mean, I think one of, one of the astonishing things. I mean, I, I um, I'm based on um, on Venice Beach right now, which um, may be the prototype in some sense for Miami Beach because it was it was called uh, it's been called Silicon Beach, and uh, I can see the tech companies moving in there. And um, I mean, given the fact that we now know that remote working is is a is a is a given, um, uh, the people will be, will be. I always say that that uh, if you can work anywhere, then it's important precisely where you work. And that you know, Hawaii is of course uh, attractive to many people, but because of the time differences, it's not. I mean, Miami's on the same on the same time zone as New York. Um, but I was just thinking in terms of the kind of the aesthetics, because I think that's. A, it's, I, I thought it was a very beautiful description. You almost feel like you're. Like you know, entering the ocean, it's almost body, it's body temperature, and you kind of slip into the ocean. And in some ways, I think Miami's like that anyway. You kind of feel very comfortable slipping in, and it, it somehow is a. I've also seen it as a kind of heterotopian space as being kind of somehow outside of mainstream America, and it's it's less uptight for sure. And I think that um, that 
I, I don't know. My my, my colleague Thomas uh, Spiegelhalter, is, he lives on Miami Beach. He start, tries to stay there as much as possible. And I remember once we were kind of jaywalking or maybe about to jaywalk. He said, "Don't worry, we're at the beach. Relax." And and I think that sums up many things that much about Miami. But the thing I thought I find interesting is, that it, I mean, some of the the exquisite uh, interiors of the um, the hotels there and the restaurants. Um, I mean, Bazaar is my particular kind of favorite there, um, but they're exquisite. They're, they're kind of, I, I describe these as being aesthetic cocoons. I mean, you're in this um, welcoming environment. And it reminded me really, when I first started thinking about this, I was invited by Bernard Shumi, who designed our building, of course, to, um, to New York. And it, of course, it was, you were jet lagged. It was exhausting to fly across. But then he put me up in one of these Ian Schrager hotels. It's very exquisitely designed um, by Philip Stark. And you know, you, okay. you you arrived there, and you you came, and you were jet lagged, and you'd got a taxi from JFK, and and you you know you've been through you know all this. The the it's, it's actually was hassle. Traveling's a hassle. It might there are nice aspects, but it's a hassle. Then suddenly you found yourself in this, this exquisite kind of. Uh, um, it's space and 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 it was just so reassuring you it was almost like you were back in the womb in some sense you were completely nurtured and things and and i think that has a huge role to do not just the the, the warmth and the and the of the ocean and so on but the kind of the the exquisiteness of of, of miami and, you know and i think there's an interesting kind of question as to why um all these incredibly talented architects have been brought to miami um uh, not just Zaha, but also Gary and Herzog de Moran. They were the designers of the um, of the garage structure, which is a garage structure, but it's the most exquisite garage structure. And in a sense, you know, maybe that's something about Miami. It's kind of, um, I mean, there's a certain necessity for some things, but it, it kind of, there's certain moments on Miami Beach where it really raises the level to something very, very special. So um, I, I just find your thoughts very uh Provocative, and I've often wondered about the secret of Miami and what is the the, the 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 appeal about it, and it is that I think that openness and so on. Um, but let me open this up to to some discussion from from um, from from the, the the various candidates on the on the DDES and and uh, and De Grey also, my colleague who's here. Um, uh, I, yeah, I think that was actually I must must have must say it, it was wonderful to see it in the eyes of for somebody who's traveled through this sort of history um, and has such experience of the Italian world before before Miami, because I think you brought it to life in a, in a wonderful new way. But let me uh, open up to uh, uh, possible questions. I, I can start <laughs> just to, to break the ice. Uh, hello, and um, it was a, a, a beautiful, a, a beautiful talk, and what you show it made me think a lot, uh, a lot about um, not only about Miami but also about uh, Versace. And I mean, I'm I'm knowing uh, more about Miami, but through images. All, all what I know, I'm I'm in Argentina. I'm I'm Argentinian, and uh, I I never been in in Miami, and but I'm in a way knowing certain things uh, about Miami through images. So uh, my, my, maybe my comment and question at the same time is about these images. Um, so I, I could see that in a way, the image of uh, Gianni Versace and his design uh, as a kind of object of cult, no? Like an, an object of cult. And uh, I, I cannot escape to this idea of the fetiche, no? And the fetishization, not only of uh, his designs, but also about the fact, about the fact of his death, for example. Uh, so in that way, they are like a play of, uh, with, with these two words. Uh, I read a book from Bruno Latour a few years ago, and it's like this relation between the, between the, the, the fetiche and the facts, no? Because in a way, the fetiche is like a kind of uh, enchantment thing, like a, like a charming thing. No, it seems like something uh, magic in a way uh, because of the relation with the objects and what we believe that the objects are in a way is related with Neil was saying about the idea of the dead of the life. And uh, if we believe that the, for example, our buildings are alive or the sculptures are alive. Um, and I'm uh, also, I have like uh, Portuguese roots. And I said like the, the origin of this word of the fetiche. The it's fetish, related... fetish. Fetish, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 
fetish in Argentina <laughs> in Spanish, yeah, sorry. Uh, fetish is, uh, the idea of the fetish is like, um, yes, this idea that you, you put like certain you, uh, properties to an object. Uh, so it's this idea of the uh, charm, charmed or enchar enchanted, no? like this idea that you believe that the objects are more than what they really are, like a fact. So uh, with all this introduction, I, I wanted to ask you about how do you think that um, the facts and the fetishers are blended, are, are blended, are, uh, blend their properties in a way in the, in the story of uh, Versace, no? the idea of what we believe that this, their designs are and the idea that uh, he died there in Miami and all the construction uh, or the art, uh, artificial construction in that way about all this uh, story. Well, Maria, this is really uh, my, my most fascinated, uh, uh, um, that, how to say, the, my interest in all my life. I'm always interested in symbols. And I, if I go to a bookstore and since you know, I was student time in London, I always buy the books. And that's why Umberto Eco uh, was my teacher in, in Bologna. At that time, I was always like the symbols, the Nome de la Rosa. And I would just, and you did, talking about the fetish and, uh, and uh, the fate. It's so interesting, you know, your, your architect, your, your, your precision, your, you know, your, the, 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 the lines and the, and I, you know, I study all my life from Beijing and the things. And actually, I have to say, I do. I have all this, all my life, even till today, I deep believe in, in symbols, in signs. As you mentioned about the fetish, you know, the, 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 the Medusa. It's, it's kind of things if, if people ask me, do you believe, do you, are you superstitious? I think in many ways I, I am. And I believe this kind of, you said a blend is like the facts and things. But I, I don't really, Maria, I don't see this really a blend into a kind of organic things that like to um, what happened to life of Versace. I think it's really, um, the impact, I think that he's, um, Versace is this kind of, uh, um, the Southern Italian roots, as you know, the, the Medusa head, which the, actually was, um, is the symbol of the Sicily region, you know, the, the big, big uh, head of Medusa. So Medusa, it's really deep rooted in the Southern it Italian culture and, um, and of course, the story is about, you know, there's violent and there's kind of, a, a, you know, aggression, the jealous and revenge. But it, but it sounds like it almost like nothing to do about the beauty, fashion, you know, attractiveness. So there's, a, then he turned, Versace turned into this Medusa into something that, you know, is like the, uh, the power of alluring the people. So this kind of, uh, the dangers of beauty, beauty of the danger. So th this is kind of a two sign of thing, they play the fire. You know, I think sometimes I, as you know, being a Chinese, as I think there's so many, uh, uh, your students Chinese, we, we call the Zhong Yong in the middle way. The, you know, so I think that there's really a contrast in, in, the, in, in Versace is that it's about, you know, as, as, in the, as I mentioned, is to capture and eventually you'll be captured. As Neil said, stone, you want stone, but you'll be stoned. And you you want to, to, to dress to kill you and same time you'll be killed. So I think this is really a not, they can't be blend together. It's about how you find the balance. I think in this way, I will sometimes being a Chinese and, and, and live Italy and, and educate UK, I sometimes try to find the really the the understanding in different cultures to and to for myself and myself to the world and to observe the others how about how to balance and to find the middle way and and I think the fact and the fetish can they be mingled together or as you said blended insert together I think it's just one another can be on top, but we as artists, as, as a creator, as, as a, you know, live human beings, I think in this moment, I would tell myself, thinking as old Chinese, 
to find a balance, to find a way that you 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 go through it, but the uh, uh, never put in a way that to over weighing things so th that's was the way i see I, I i love to discuss more about that it's that the, the, how is it possible to 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 blend to mink together or we have to be in the chinese way saying let's find the zhong yong zhi dao the way of in the middle Yeah, I, I often I think that also this the, the concept of yin yang is kind of an interesting one. Yeah. I, I'm interested in the dialectic or yeah. what Deleuze yeah. calls the reciprocal presupposition, how two opposites kind of come together in some way. Um, yeah. You know. Let's have some some other questions. I I, I one thing I mean I do, I can understand uh, Marina's co comment about the about the blurring and the blending in some way because you know one thing especially about this moment in time um, which. Um, and maybe we discovered something about Miami also because I I I, I wanted to put the have our our, 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 our week a week long workshop this moment in time precisely because we could it was actually part of the Chinese New Year time and actually that's why we're red <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and I you know actually in some ways you know I know with, with the opposite I mean Miami is is most of the year is twelve hours out of sync with with China but one. Can't imagine also a more attractive place to be in, 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 in if you're in Beijing right now than to come to Miami. And I think it's like, to my mind the kind of what is I find really interesting about anywhere that I kind of perceive as a kind of paradise in certain ways is the fact that there is there's no real sense at a certain moment of time it gets oppressively hot and, and humid in the summer, but this time of the year, inside and outside is almost the same temperature as in as is the ocean and outside. There's this kind of from that point of view, I can see exactly what uh, Marina's talking about in terms of this kind of blurring or blending, and you can move effortlessly, um, uh, as you say. Um, and uh, you know there is also the, uh, and the other comment to sort of say like maybe mention is the fact that that uh, it, it was welcoming it's welcoming for, for gay culture in many ways but also welcoming for the jewish culture this was a place where you know um that, that i mean famously uh, Miami beach um welcomed a, a jewish community and has been now a central part of of, of life on Miami beach um so let's yeah, but a very still still very rare uh, Asian, you know. I, I will I hope you know the um, because I think it's the temperature and the, and um, the weather. You know, I think I I was really um, uh, uh, being a Chinese a Asian. I'm very tan and, and very dark skin. And uh, so once this my my friend from Shanghai visited me in in, in Miami, so we took picture together and they post on WeChat. And then all the friends in China said, "Who this?" You know, tanned, dark skinned uh, uh, lady. So my friend make a joke. That's a sister of Johnny Versace. So and I said, wow. And and I think that's this because to see an Asian with a tan skin with dark is really it's, it's beyond the imagination. I think it's interesting that I think the weather really make it Asian a little bit hesitant. Oh, it's too hot. It's you, you get really tanned. But I think new generation. I, I'm sure that you know are changing. But I wish it is a more uh, Asian student and a more uh, scholars to come to Miami and uh, to to criticize our Asian community and still is very minor and mainly is Latin Americans and more and more than ever it's Italian French and of course uh, and uh, English and uh, but I think the French Italian Spanish is, is, is a quite a large European community and then the, the, the majority are Latin Americans you know like Maria and a lot of Argentinians Brazilians and the Venezuelans this is really really uh, took over the, the the stage, the landscape of uh, Miami. It's, it's, it's due to the capital of Latin America. Yeah, no, just one last comment and uh, I can move for the, the rest of the candidates. But I, I believe that you gave me uh, a, a great uh, title for my study about Miami because one part of the class is to study something about Miami. And I believe you gave me a, a great title because you talk about dangerous beauty. And I believe that it could be like something really interesting to develop in the uh, what it means to be in Miami and what it means Miami as a as a place, as a site. Because uh, we we were talking about this uh, now that I can't like put together all the classes that we had before about this idea of the the the, uh, the 
there are some uh, dangerous thing about beauty or the dangers of beauty and the beauty of the dangerous as uh, yeah, something Maria, super interesting. I, I would recommend you when you start dissertation, start the first page of the poetry of Baudelaire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's that. That's I mean, I, of course, typically in history, maybe Greg could say more about this than I could. But the, the picturesque and the sublime have gone together in some way, you know. And, and uh, the dangerous beauty is, I guess, I uh, I mean, I was brought up this way, right? Let me say, in in in, in you know, in 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 the UK, we had this uh, James Bond was was a uh, was um. Uh, the central kind of figure, the mythology, in a sense, in the Cold War, and, and the, the the dangerous beauty was, you know, there was always a, a someone, uh, some beautiful spy from Russia or something or whatever that was both beautiful and dangerous. And I've I've often thought the kind of the, the the way the cocktail, which is always looks beautiful, potentially can be dangerous, or maybe the kind of mushroom, this beautiful coloured mushroom, the danger and beauty are much more dialectical than we we yeah, often think. Uh, yeah. Now can I demystify your jump bond? I met. Um, uh, the the um, what's his name just passed away uh, the James Bond um, Sean Connery oh, yeah John Connery yeah 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 I met him in person and many times in um, in the in the in the uh, in his home in the what's his name the Bahamas and uh, he lives next to my friend's home and he put his um, a big big board because all the Japanese tourists love to take pictures of uh, of his home called out of the bond, <laughs> he's like out of the bond. And um, he play golf every day. And uh, you know, we sometimes the, the community, there's a called Life for Key. Life for Key, is, uh, he lives in Life for Key and uh, I visited my friend, so he, he next to. So one the first time my friend said, look, tonight we have this club, Life for Key uh, events night. And Sean Connery will, you know, I talked to, uh, to his wife, Michelle, he will be there. So I was so excited that finally I will see James Bond. So I went to um, Bahamas, which is very close to, very close to Miami, you know, it's like a half an hour flights and things. So I went to the Bahamas and uh, spent a week and I saw, you know, now I can't believe it. In my, you know, my kind of imagination, he's such a tall, you know, strong impact. And I saw this little short, it's a kind, sweet old man and say, hello, how are you? And I was really, God, I said, this is, this is James Bond. So what is interesting that I just said it is, it's really um, uh, um, in the Miami, living in Miami, all, all these things happened, you know, uh, uh, Miami, around the Miami and uh, it's, um, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I do have something to add. And that yeah. is when uh, Gianni Versace was there, it was the late, um, the mid to late nineties, right? Uh, he lived in Miami 1992, he started to renovate it, and he lived up to 1997, so it is only five years. Yeah, yeah, well, at that time was when Miami Beach was transforming radically. Yes. That yeah. uh, for a long time, Miami Beach had been um, almost a rest home. They call it the yeah. <laughs> God's waiting room. Yes, uh, yes. That there were a lot of elderly mostly Jewish people who lived in uh, what had been hotels. They were kind of rooming houses at that point. Um, that they, this, you know, they had come to Miami Beach sort of after World War II. It was like a lot of them had, had migrated from Russia or they used to call it Borscht Beach. And uh, they came, it was like, you're, you're older, you've been living in New York, you retire, you just say the heck with it, I'm going to Miami. And they retired, uh, a lot of them to Miami Beach and, and that particular South Beach area was um, very run down for a long time. That it was a, <clears throat> you know, elderly, not wealthy population. And there were just a few developers who saw uh, the potential in it. And it was a radical transformation that took place in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s. It was actually quite quick. And so when I arrived in 97, that I had a studio on, um, on Lincoln Road for, for a couple of years. And I remember that juxtaposition that there were, you know, 
artists and they were fashionable people and uh, Lincoln Road had only recently been renovated. But at the same time, there were still the elderly population. And I remember one very frail uh, woman, elderly woman who used to walk on, um, on Lincoln Road. And she wore a specific color. One day she would be lime green from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. And the next day she would be orange or yellow. And she was, you know, obviously not wealthy, but she was a character. And there were a number of people like that, that, um, that gave that place, well, a sort of edginess. And I think maybe those were the qualities that, uh, that attracted people to Miami Beach. And of course, what happened was that the real estate, all the prices all went up and uh, all those people either died or were or moved out or had to move out. Um, so I'm just saying that at the moment when Gianni Versace came in and saw that house, which of course at that time was probably terribly run down. Yeah, it's called the Amsterdam House. Amsterdam House is Yeah. Like yeah, it was like a rooming house. Yes, yeah. And uh, but I think those were the qualities he probably enjoyed. Yeah. And you know, he actually that he bought the Amsterdam House and he he, he tried to get uh, the hotel next to that one. It's called Hotel Reverse and you know is it, nobody can make it happen because that was kind of art that called this trade is difficult to, you know, it's not different fe uh, feature of the art that called the historical uh, heritage. So, but in the end, I, you know, as Donadella said, I don't, and my, 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 my brother always make miracles. So he bought the hotel next to the, the, the mansion and he transformed it to a garden and, uh, and the swimming pool. So even he did a great job with his uh, uh, Casa Casulina. He get even reward of this uh, preservation of the art deco as get a reward, and as the first one get a reward as a, as a, as a European. So this was really at the moment of. Uh, transformation at that time um, uh, the ocean boulevard you can see this run you know some kind of fashion models took some pic wild pictures and uh, and the people uh, and this one just come out i think a few years ago it's, it's a photographer he took pictures of all the Miami beach in the 50s 60s and uh, that was really spectacular. And now they're showing all the photographies in the Pest, uh, Pesty Hotel on the Ocean Boulevard. I, I just saw it uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's really nice, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the, the photography over Mayan Beach in the old time. Uh, it's 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 just like it's for me as a new uh, Miami, Miami uh, 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 you know person that it was really uh, eyes open. Wow, that is Miami. <laughs> Yes, it's true. Yeah, there's a, there's a lovely book. Um, I think it's called, I don't know, Miami Beach Remembered or something like that. I've got it. I can dig it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. They're, yeah, but they're pictures of this older crowd and they're yes. sort of, and they're, they're wonderful photos of just yes. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. Just it's that, true. that sort of fading character of the, um, of the beach. But still today, in Miami today, it's like here. Actually, that Miami, it, it's kind of a staging. It's like you almost legitimize to play, to be player. You know, it, I remember in Art Basel, and uh, you know, you go to Art Basel in Basel, Switzerland. You go to Art Basel in Hong Kong. You go to all this, you know, Paris. It's almost like, you know, you are in the very certain kind of way. But Miami Beach, you allow this, you know, the people who come in with the flying ties and, you know, all, all the, uh, um, uh, the color of the hair. I think Miami has this kind of a, a flare in the air that, you know, you're okay to play around. This is this world is a stage it's all on you so i think it's kind of a as as a nail said it's, it's kind of a glowing into it it's a, a sleep slippery into it weave into it and uh, and feel comfortable with it and you can be yourself 
I think that's the kind of. I'll just uh, just be, uh, if you feel well, and since you spent much of your time, some of your time in London, I, I was. I mean, I mentioned this before in previous sessions, but it. I, it, I think uh, Miami Beach somehow reminds me of, of Brighton uh, in a sense that because in the south coast in England, it's kind of Costa Geriatrica or maybe God's waiting room. But, uh, but uh, there's one. There's, Brighton is so interesting because it's so different. It's, it's and, and the Prince Regent discovered it in a kind of way a little similar to um, Gianni Versace and made this kind of incredible palace. You know, with the with this kind of Chinois interior. And, and Indian exterior, which really kind of brought some magic to the place. And it, it became a kind of like a, in a way, the umbilical card or quarter, the, the train route from, from London to Brighton. And suddenly it is the closest place to get to, to escape from London, but it becomes this, in a sense, a uh, space of escapism where you kind of escape from various your know, concerns and things. And it's, it's this kind of magical um, other space in some way. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I think that's the, maybe the weather and the cultures make difference. And, I, and you mentioned about the Vegas. I, I also live, you know, a few years, but just uh, Vegas. I think that, you know, like like not far away from Miami to uh, Cancun, I almost feel like a really bad version of Miami. I, I hate it. I couldn't stand it after one day as I'm going to live. <laughs> so Miami, the why Miami is just as, as ever, the the traction and standing high and the people more and more people move to Miami, you know, I think this, this city has culture. He's, he, he kept me here because I am dying. I couldn't live without the music, the, the, the art, the, the lectures and things. But I, I'm, after 80 years, it's the longest time I ever I live. I live the once, you know, after five years, I have to move on. I live in Miami and I think I still feel blessed. I live in Miami ever, even now in the COVID. I think this, this is, a, a, you know, the culture. And it's blended in the Latino culture, the European culture, and and, and Jewish culture, and, and people from New York, from Canada, from other coast, and bring into it. And this is a city, a generous. It lets these all the things be together without judgment. So I think that's why I it kept me here. It, it, it's still keeping me here, living in Miami after eight years, which is really longest ever. I, I live, I move on. So. Beside the COVID, maybe the COVID, but I think Miami has this kind of, uh, um, I think inner strength. It's kind of uh, in inside of you, and and as as Maria said, it's kind of uh, I could say the fetish power, whatever. It's it's energy, make everybody feel that you are welcomed, and you find your own Miami in your heart. I'd, I'd like to, to invite some of our um, candidates to kind of make some comments. Um, I know that Elena is, uh, who's from Russia, who's almost everybody actually in our group has got this kind of exotic trajectory and, and they've been through many countries and been on a journey and uh, a nom nomadic intellectually and, and kind of like geographically. But Elena comes from um, St. Petersburg, or at least was brought up in, in Russia and things. and. Uh, and spent some time, in fact, in, in, in China as part of her background. But uh, she's there now. We're all very envious about her. Eleanor, привет. Uh, good morning, привет. And uh, I really like the comment from Gray about the Borscht Beach. I was laughing for a few minutes, like nonstop. Probably we need to rename uh, Brighton Beach in New York as well. And thank you for a fantastic lecture. It was uh, really very interesting. And you made very accurate and um, sensible, like, in terms of sensibility comments about New Yorkers, because I live in New York and I'm very frequent flyer to Miami. And you cannot imagine how many friends, classmates and classmates I keep meeting every like day here. And it's like, it's like, seriously, everybody in New York here and it seems like, yes. And um, you made very accurate comments about that um, people come here because we feel happy. And this is, was actually my answer yesterday when uh, one person asked me, uh, why you keep coming to Miami that often? I said, I feel very happy here and I want to always come back here because it's like the vibe, the people is very, everything relaxing here and it's great. And um, I would like to make a comment about the fashion since this is, was lecture about the fashion. And I work um, quite a little in fashion industry in uh, New York Fashion Week. So I was a backstage photographer and runway photographer as well for a few Russian and Chinese magazines. Um, do you, how how you see difference uh, in uh, fashion industry approach back in 90s and 80s?
for example, we had like uh, supermodels who were created back 90s. Everybody had Sullivan style, uh, Linda Evangelista, Claudia Schiffer, Naomi Campbell. And um, we had a lot of like historical photographers, for example, Paolo Roversi, Stephen Maisel, Helmut Newton. So it was every shooting was a certain story ta um, tale. It was narrative. It was artistry. And now it feels the hot couture, it was overtaken by fast fashion. So everything what we see, even like um, if you take the top 10 fashion magazines and you're going through the magazines, you can see, okay, this is kind of the simulation of uh, Stephen Maisel shooting, or this is kind of referral to Lindbergh shootings. So it's kind of repetition. And I don't see a lot new happening right now in the fashion industry. It's everything like going back and replicating the old stuff. So what do you think about it? So you are my neighbors. I'm so happy we should meet. <laughs> and yes. we have a coffee together in the Miami <laughs> Beach. So Elena, I'm so happy you mentioned that. You know, I'm I'm in the in the I write for um Mali Claire in um fashion uh, air magazine in Hong Kong, the very, very first edition in Chinese and not even mainland that time is only in Hong Kong. I wrote in uh, in English and Chinese um, for Hong Kong. So I, I was really early stage when I was student, I already tried to make some money and to, to introduce myself to Hong Kong fashion world. So look, you know, I can write, I can go to the fashion show for you and uh, you don't have to send a reporter. I wrote Chinese. So I was really, really in, in that time in the supermodel, uh, era and the witness, you know, the, 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 that's really the, the Milanese, the Salotto at that time. I think at that time you said so well, it's, you know, all this uh, like um, Hamilton Newton, the Bruce Weber, all this, uh, they are not just technically as a photographer, you know, that time there's no digitals, no everything. It's, it's a Cartier Bresson in the, in the fashion world, you tell the stories. It, you know, it is not so much, I think that uh, Johnny Versace started to have these bright colors. You know, a lot of time before it's black, white. It's a lot about the light, the, the, you know, the, the, the shadows, the, the, you know, the architecture in the image, not just, you know, visuals uh, capture your, your, your excitement. It's a more deep, it's a storyteller. So one, uh, at that time, and the fashion, photographer and the fashion world if from the supermodel we you know you it's not only about the beauty it's about the personality and and you know i i was in that time because i was so tall at, at, in, in that time and i'm really very few chinese around in italy in an, in the beginning of, of in the in the 80s 90s so i was easily to pick up and things but at that time i think i always still thinking myself and i i know i'm not this kind of a, you know the, the um, Monica Bellucci's beauty, but I think that people really looking for character have to find some the girls has story to tell. Even they are young, but they have they are they are making the story, so being telling the story and making story into it. So the the, the length of the of the photographer is not just the shape of the body, but to capture the soul. And, and now I think today, because all these things, as you know, you're a photographer in the fashion week. And actually I'm in the New York, uh, actually this week should be New York week. We should be in New York. But, and uh, I think that the digitalizations, all this kind of uh, technology really diminished in the, the, the personal, become impersonal. And, and then, you know, this, this kind of fashion is a more to the marketing and, and, and the mass consumption. So it's like, the image you captured is not going to stay for long. So it's really a, a kind of a fast food consumption, even it's not food, but it's the image is consumed instantly and that's over. So I think the hist history is shortened today. And in the past, the history is about the heritage. Fantastic answer, thank you. Welcome. Elena, remember, we had to meet. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I'm so happy that you live in Miami. 
I, I even don't want to come back uh, to New York. I opening newspapers. I see tons of snow storms and I'm like closing newspapers and I'm saying, God bless, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, it's really, you know, and um, and actually, you know, I, in, after this lecture, I'm going to Palm Beach and we have, a, you know, all these top art galleries from New York. They're not open there. They're open in, in Palm Beach and uh, Palm Beach, yeah. had a great, great show. And, you know, like Aqua Villa, you know, from uh, uh, Dominic uh, Gravy, um, White Cube from London. They all have a gallery in Palm Beach. So it's, it's, it's a one hour uh, drive. So it's really a kind of things happening in, in around Miami and in Miami as well. I've been in a few galleries um, recently uh, at the beginning of the week in the Palm Beach. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's, it's really um, um, very um, vibrant at the and moment. It's very impressive how the culture is changing here fast. Uh, for example, when I first time came to Miami 10 years ago and now and how fast it's growing up and the more galleries is open, the more artists want to showcase their artwork here and it's becoming more and more popular. Maybe one day it's been even will outbeat New York. Maybe I, I, I could clearly see it. Just yeah, I, I had a feeling too. You know, so for the gallery like uh, Aqua Villa or or like a Dominic Levy, that's the gallery on the Fifth Avenue, Madison, or or in the uh, Chelsea, and a White Cube is in the you know, and they make investment effort to open the gallery, not just a pop up, being their location. I think it's really had a sign of the of of this kind of a migrant of the tension from um, from New York and to um, to Florida to Miami and Palm Beach. I I I'm 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 wondering. I actually it is uh, what I find interesting about if you can compare you to to, to Zaha to, to Gianni Versace. I mean, you're all different in your own way, but similar also because you're you're both kind of you're all kind of pioneers in the sense that that. Uh, you were able to, I mean, apart from the kind of discovering of Miami itself, but uh, Miami Beach itself, each of you has somehow find a new way to kind of configure things in a new way. I mean, Zaha really was kind of, she lent something very magical to architecture that wasn't there before. And it just, she brought it alive in some sort of way. And, and Gianni Versace saw these possibilities of bringing together music and fashion and Diana and royalty and, and so on in this kind of this, very heady mix of things. And and I think also in, in many ways, I mean, you're a pioneer in many ways. You're the first Chinese to be involved in the, in the, the fashion world in Milan and to bring back the message, you know, Marco, Marco Polo style to, to China. And I'm wondering whether whether we might see some kind of, you're maybe the, 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 the kind of catalyst that might uh, uh, begin to spark a certain interest in, in Miami Beach among the Chinese community. We don't have so many as yet. And yet it seems to me, perfectly placed for for Chinese I mean just to hear from from maybe some of our uh, the colleagues here who got a, who are in China or brought up in China especially in, in in Beijing where it's kind of freezing this time of the year um to hear what you have to say I mean is this is it the, the question I think which was raised before is is this some kind of prototype of a a kind of possible uh, alternative, I wouldn't say ideal community, but a, a model that maybe uh, could be kind of a pioneering model in itself, that kind of blend of, of, of uh, high fashion art world, uh, you know, Caribbean uh, climate and, and exotic uh, uh, bars, restaurants, hotels, and, and, and very glamorous architecture as a, a kind of formula that might become very popular elsewhere in the future. I don't know if anyone wants to kind of respond to that in some way. I mean, it, it, you know, in some ways, I, I, uh, I, I kind of, and I think that alongside um, uh, Jenny Versace, there were other things happening as well. I don't think he was alone in this thing. I, I think that in some ways, um, Wallpaper Magazine, which I think, I don't know when Wallpaper started, but possibly around 1995, 7, 6, 7. And that was interesting because it, um, in some ways, it wrapped architecture up in a different kind of um, set of associations. In a sense, you know, up until then, it had been, I would say, architecture had been a fairly dour discipline in some senses. It was very isolated, but suddenly it got repackaged in terms of some kind of lifestyle where, um, you know, it was, it was, it was part of glamour, you know, and, and it was a backdrop for something. And I, 
I, you know, it's almost like it was a, like a dream space. If you looked at wallpaper, it was about dreaming about the possibility of an alternative sort of vision. Um, and, 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 you know, it wasn't, you know, they would give a recipe for something. You wouldn't actually make the thing, but you'd dream about the pot. You'd make the dream about the possibility of what it might lead to. And, and that I think is, is, is something that, uh, uh, is there and you know even if you look at I mean Giovanni Versace's fashions I mean you you now get sort of secondary brands which are uh, in a way much cheaper right and, and but at the same time you're dreaming about that the supermodel thing and I think it's a it's an interesting sort of uh, uh, idea to conjure with what what it stood for and how architecture gets kind of in a sense um, uh, rebranded in a way that you know I think Saha was very much in China was always a brand and, and the idea that you bring these I mean, you know, the Herzog de Moore and are a kind of high level brand in architecture and, and man is a natural place where even a car park is becomes a Jenny Versace, becomes a Herzog de Moore building. In fact, the, you know, people just, you know, a, a kind of a joke said you, you can't uh, um, be not beautiful live in Miami Beach uh, or you can't, you know, it's, it's really, as you said, it's, it's city with, you know, like Enzo Piano is building this uh, uh, Park 87. You can from a Fendi Chateau to Ama Gaza, my, uh, 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 my, uh, Amani and you, you come from all this kind of, you know, it doesn't give other names, but you just look at all these uh, callings, you go toward uh, uh, Ventura to uh, uh, Sunny L, you know, you just name it, it's all the brand. You know, you're talking from a, a, a Fendi Gaza, a, 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 um, Fendi Chateau, Gaza, my, uh, uh, and Porsche design, and you just go ahead, you, you know, so the branding, it's not just a marketing concept, it's our everyday life in Miami. That's what I meant in some ways, is, is that when you associate a brand, you know, for example, if you've, you've seen David Beckham playing football in Adidas, you wear Adidas and you imagine you can be kind of uh, D David Beckham in some way. And it's kind of interesting that, that Beckham has himself also chosen Miami as the space in which to uh, operate and of course, Victoria Beckham is in the fashion world as well. So I, you know, I, I can see that it's kind of like that idea of the fetish is actually interesting because you can take it further to think about it in terms of kind of um, uh, 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 this kind of magical, magical kind of combination of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, the, 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 the Beckham live in the 1000 Museum. Do you remember the, 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 the yeah. The one where, you know, the Patrick said that they live, they bought apartment in the Zaha building. And I met, um, and it's just typical um, a Miami story. I was in a Soho house, which is, you know, Soho house from London. And uh, then we have a Soho beach house in Miami. And it was really the place. When you arrive in Miami, the best thing you can do, be a member of the Soho house. You really meet interesting people from, and, you know, the members are the architect, you know, a, a journalist a, a, and uh, artist, a magazine owner. So it's really nice. So I, I become a member right away when I arrive in the. So one day I was uh, in the in in Miami uh, Soho Beach House, and someone who in front is people are talking, and this gentleman just turned their head. You know, I'm not really sports fan, but I thought this person I know. When he turned his head toward me, I said, "That's David Beckham." <laughs> so I said, "Oh, great!" I said, "I said." May I ask, sir, are you uh, Devin Beckham? He said, yeah, madam, I'm a Devin Beckham. He just sitting in front of me with his, you know, it's just like such, a, you know, of course, in, in, in so House, you can't take pictures, you are members, you're very discreet, but it's just like you are in Miami. Me, I would never ever thought in my whole life to meet, to see a, a David Beckham sitting in front of me and chatting and things. So that's kind of Miami, which is you really don't know. It's kind of a pl place that, Every day did a surprise, uh, and you don't know, you know, who you meet, or what you find. It's it's just an exciting place to, to and um, people are uh, kind of a hide and seek, and at the same time they are there around you. So you discover Miami, uh, uh, you, you know, constantly and continue to find the beauty of Miami Beach. Let's um let's open up to some questions from from the team. Um, Thank you for your nice uh, presentation, Shifu. Shifu, 
Fushin. Yeah. Fushin. Fushin. Sorry, Fushin. Yeah, you're in yeah. China. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I saw you. Uh, I heard you mention some of the Chinese um, uh, philosophy in your explanation. I think that's uh, very beautiful. And I just wondering, how do you think about this uh, Chinese philosophy with your um, design intention, or your appealing about design in in this way? Maybe you can share some more about that. Maybe it's not just about the Miami Beach uh, or Miami. Well, I, I know I, I since I was a little girl, as as a, you know, I I was born in uh, in Beida and you know, grew up uh, in the young years in Shanghai in the French concession with my grandparents because uh, my uh, my parents both uh, uh, were professor of Beijing University and they were, my father was in the labor camp and my mother was sent to the factory. So I was, you know, kind of a, oh, since a very young age, I blended with the Beijing culture, but very proper academic, but at the same time, I, I spent time with the grandparents in the French concession in Shanghai. So I, when I was a student in, in China, and, and my, I remember my teacher said, Xin, you don't know how to, you know, to live your, uh, your life with your head down. Because I always try to be uh, different <laughs> and, you know, dress, you know, speak different, learn different. And, um, so as, as I mentioned about Zhong Yong Zhi Dao in the middle has been always something I make an effort to be. Maybe the sometimes I thought of the reason I left China, went to Italy is that I feel like it's hard to, for me to be this Chinese philosophy, to be neutral, to be Zhong Yong, because Zhong is in the middle. Yong means normal, nothing special. Yong means like ordinary. So Zhong Yong Zhi Dao, the way of in the middle and to be ordinary has been never been in my own personal dictionary because I, oh, I'm kind of artistic. I want to be different. I want to think. So I think Italy has been really kind of a, a, a saved me in a way that I, I mean, but I really like to share with, with you about this kind of a, it, getting older, you know, I'm, I'm being 50 now and I, I find in, in my own life, and when I was young, I tried to against, try to be, I said, this is really something I want to throw away. This is some Chinese kind of, you know, very, um, you know, kind of a passive way of look at the world and position myself in the middle to be ordinary is the way to be safe, to be accepted. And it was completely uh, against my young years of the spirit. And, uh, but at the young and getting older and mature and experience so much and things in life, actually, I really think it is the way to really, and to, uh, as Maria said, how to, to, to blend, to, to get really finding a balance. And, and of course, I made a lot of mistakes in my young years. I wish some things that I did, I, I should do it, I, 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 but I, why I didn't do it. But if I could have that, you know, I'm not through with totally this Chinese philosophy to really find the balance in my own career life, my personal life or anything, I think I might achieve more. And maybe I will, you know, using my time, uh, energy more wisely. So as, a, as a older uh, 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 and, and academic or, or late, I would like to say the best way is to, as say, East Midwest, the history at the present, the philosophy in what we had in young years as you know, as, as, as Chinese and what you learn in to put together organically, digest well, and be, be part of you. I think that was that would be my advice and my experience. Thank you so much. That's really nice. Yeah, I'm uh, in the middle of uh, um, 30s to 40 almost. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. Because um, I think uh, uh, be in the middle is not, uh, um, not just about to be in general. But I, I, from me, I more understand it's for for us to be neutral. Yeah, to be neutral about uh, our perspectives, be neutral about uh, our opinions about things, and 
yeah, I think that is the the ground we should stand with. Yeah, and I then think we don't have more. a yeah. Yeah, then we don't have a bias, for instance. Yeah, I think that we can accept things. Valid. Yeah, I agree. I was too. I was young, you know. At that time, you know, in the in the in the eighties. You know, I was just, the, our country just opened. So I was so rebellious and being typical Aquarius. <laughs> I'm, I'm the typical and so creative and want to be different. And I think that if I could go back, I would definitely share with, you know, what you said and what my experience, it's like a massage and things. I will be, find a more balance, you know, and um, create is my own way, but uh, to, um, to, fit myself better around a surroundings. Thanks for sharing. You're so welcome. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I love to yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Great. No, can I just, but one thing I, I mean, I, I, we mentioned French concession and, and that, I mean, that's always been very appealing to me and I'm not sure many um, here know about the French concession, but it's kind of, it's an interesting part of, of Shanghai in the sense of it's it's really the melting pot of different sort of cultures. It, it is in some ways the most Shanghai part of Shanghai, to my mind anyway. And Shanghai's had this kind of, dub, it's had two moments in its history. One in the 1930s when it was really the gateway to China and a really kind of a, a very special place. Then it closed down for a while and now it's opening up and in many ways much more kind of cosmopolitan um, than, than well, in, in the sense of culturally mixing and so on, than, than Beijing, but, were, you know, uh, but I, I'm interested in, in, in your your research, as I understand, your doctoral research at Oxford was about fashion in 1930s. Um, yeah, it's uh, about the image of uh, the, 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 the new girl, you know, the Chinese say xin yu xin, the new girl, the image of women in Shanghai in 1926 to 36 is my dissertation title. Of course, it's about the, how the, the image of women in, in, the, in, in, you know, in publicity, in newspaper, in, uh, in, in the film, in the stage, how this image of women be in, in the process of modernization of the city. So can they push and pull the dynamic and as a consumer and same time as the as the as a creator. So it's it's it, I am really enjoyed this this experience in Oxford with uh, with my supervisor and uh, I I'm still in, in you know in a way I was born in Shanghai I am born in Beijing but I still think I'm quite Shanghai girl. <laughs> Yeah, in the French concession, in fact, I, my family live in the Fuxin Road, it's like my name, but with extra G, Fuxin. Um, yeah, the, to, to, in Shanghai still today, if you, uh, you know, live in French concession, it's almost like a crown as elite. As you know, you it's different. You know, Shanghai uh, uh, French concession uh, in 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 the after Second Opium War, Shanghai divided into three parts. One is French concession was considered as a French territory. So, and then with the English American settlement with the bond with all the banks, you know, all the offices. And then we have a Chinese city, which is the old city called Cheng Huang Miao. And it's only Chinese because at that time they think Chinese is not really uh, presentable. So they, they come out uh, during the day to work and during the night they have to go back to their own city and they be locked. So it's kind of an interesting kind of setting, which is really painful story for Chinese, but that was kind of why the Shanghai has been divided three, even still today, it's clearly, you can see, of course now Shanghai, the Pudo, all this big area, but Shanghai that we call Shanghai city, not the great Shanghai today, we are clear to see the French concession of Shanghai and uh, the British American settlement of Shanghai and the Chinese city. No, I, I uh, Fuxing Lu, I know that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly why I live, actually. <laughs> Fuxing Road. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and I think also the other thing that that, that, that area has is, and I used to stay, and I'm trying to remember the, name of the hotel, but it, when I was staying in that area, there was a, it was, it was a hotel, and it was actually, um, uh, a former kind of gangster. It was the house of a former gangster. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Donghu Dong Dong Hotel. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of like in some ways, there's something similar there because there is this kind of behind this kind of the gangster area of, of, of Shanghai and the kind of the, the kind of cocaine cowboys areas of Miami. I can oh, see that there's, there, yeah. I can see. 
Dongwu Bingguan is considered Mao Zedong's Bingguan. So you are very honored guest by your your it, Dongwu Bingguan. It's, it's it's the the hotel for the parties. During the Cultural Revolution, when Mao uh, come to Shanghai or all the high-ranking government officials, they stay in Donghu Bingguan. Is it with the Chinese style of the class and the glamour? It's different from, like, say, Portman or you know, a Holiday in Sheraton. That's Western modernization in the in the in the eighties in Shanghai. Uh, but the, for Chinese, the the top has a hotel as aesthetic. As the as as Chinese consider comfort is Donghu Bingguan, yeah. <laughs> it's a Mao Zedong's hotel. <laughs> now it's not a hotel. <laughs> so let's have let's have some questions. I I know that uh, Marina's got a bad contact con, uh, her contact her Zoom has dropped. So um, I might try and see if she's got any questions by by uh, to send me on WhatsApp, but. Um, uh, I, I'm also intrigued by the other people who are from from um, um, Yu Yang is in, is is in Beijing right now, um, and and actually in a in a school, I think CAF is kind of interesting because it's kind of it's a bit like the AA of China, and I think you know you, you have this sort of mix of glamour and I mean talking about Zaha and so on, where fashion and architecture and art kind of come together in an interesting kind of kind of way. Um, so I don't know if, if anyone else would like to to add any comments or um, we have Anna who's in um, Australia right now. We have uh, uh, our candidates are all over the world and Anna's um, you know, it's in many ways also there's a kind of there's a barrier reef there. So that there's a kind of another kind of parallel with with Miami. But um, I want to see if anyone has any uh, any questions. I have one more question. Um, where do you see the fashion industry in the next 10 years with all this uh, mass market and as we discussed before with the fast industry? And when <clears throat> all the flag stores, for example, in Soho, New York, they keep closing because it's quite expensive now to have a boutique, uh, the actual physical boutiques versus online stores because people start to shop more online. And we also have uh, fascinating classes with Neil on Sunday about artificial intelligence. And now it's here. Uh, is uh, do we need the models now, or it could be like holograms, or it could be something robotic? I don't know. What? How do you see the future of the fashion in these terms? Well, Elena, I, I the same question you know, because I, I'm not in the fashion world, but I'm in the art world, and and you uh, know, in, in, in I was witnessed last year that all the galleries during the art fairs like Art Basel, and they all become like a visual. You know, basically you're not going to the gallery, you go click your computer, and they bring you into the gallery with like visualize you're in the space, you look at the paintings, and they even create a video game for the art art auction house that basically you create your own character. You can go in and you love the you love the uh, you know, let's say Gauguin, you love the, the 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 Van Gogh. You can bring it, you can smash it, and you can steal it. You know, you play all this, and then the auction house is you know you you, you know every day you they just like online and um, um, curate exhibitions. Everything is like, and I'm sure that fashion as well. You see this week, uh, New York Fashion Week is like you you go into the fashion, you see all this. Well. Um, I think in 10 years, if I could, uh, if, you know, my personal, I think that the history is circle. It's like a Buddhism. I think in the end, maybe there's a solution at the moment, because, you know, we are lucky we could see each other this week, we can meet, but the most of the time, you know, you have to go through a Zoom and two things. But I think in the end, we're still looking, you know, we want to have our eye contact. We want to feel the skin. We want to hear the voice of the, of the temperature. So I think that in 10 years, I think we still go back, you know, to, it's like a fashion, you know, so, uh, before when you look at the Pucci, the, the I Pantaloni Palazzo, you know, it's like, oh, the sixties, the big, big elephant legs and things like that. But now you, last year they come back and then you certain things you kind of, you know, you know, the Gucci, you know, it's like almost like grandmothers of this kind of uh, uh, style. Then it's, so I, I believe in the end, I think we, we need each other. We are social animal. No matter is art or fashion or architecture, I think it's it, it's great the opportunity technology can bring us. It's 
and um, to be connected and to, to communicate, to keep the world turn around and running. But in the end, I still believe we need to see each other. We need to eyes to eyes. We need to have the direct contact between each other. Absolutely yeah. agree. Um, hi, um, thank you for, um, for seeing, um, thank you for your lecture. And I have, I have seen, uh, feel that I have something in common with you because uh, after I graduated from Berlin, um, although I studied in uh, urban design, but in my uh, research project, I uh, also think about something related to fashion, something wearable, the, the biolight. And uh, after the uh, graduate from uh, Barlet, I uh, even have a feeling that I want to do fashion. I want to study fashion in UAL. So um, although I don't have a chance to really go into UAL to study fashion, but I take their short course, uh, which is uh, fashion management. And I also feel that I have a, a passion to our uh, fashion design, but it's not gonna be, I know it's not gonna be my career, but I can like uh, to still think about this um uh, area to um to with my design projects in the future um so i i think that uh, you're right that technology can bring all those areas together such as fashion design architecture design uh with all the uh, techniques maybe parametric design uh we can achieve all these different um area together so uh, it's kind of like um, very exciting to me and uh, um, you and uh, this uh, kind of uh, future um, uh, direction can, can um, help me, like encourage me. Um, so I can always keep this part as, a, um, as a, I can see a hobby or um, <laughs> a part that I, I will keep in my mind or in my heart. Um, so it can be um, encourage me uh, more to develop more about design, not only architecture, but also um, I, I can do something that uh, can make our life more beautiful to, um, to do something uh, besides architecture. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just have, want to share some feelings with you. You really, um, encourage me in this, in your lecture. Thank you. Wow, Yuyang, it's so nice to hear what you share with me. Thank you. You know, I actually, I understand how you feel and actually, you know, when I'm many, you know, how many times I thought, you know, I, I was, you know, graduate uh, from, you know, studied in Beida, the political science. I would like to be, you know, ambassador, travel around the world as kind of a Marco Polo in the, in, in the, in the contemporary world. And then I, I, bec I become a journalist and in the fashion world and a correspondent in, in, in Hong Kong for Italian government to report the Hong Kong handle. So I did all this journalist, then I become a lecturer professor in, in, in Shanghai, then in art world, open galleries. So, and I also had a dream like you. I always think I know how to dress. I always, you know, have this natural boy. I know how to dress since even before I went to Italy and in, in China, I always kind of a girl who dress well, have good taste. But it's been always, like you said, it's kind of dream and I have to do this. I have to finish study, I have to do this. But same time, and you know, I always, as you said, you know, it can be a hobby, but you never know. For example, um, and um, I believe that as you, as you study architect and you art, uh, you know, architect and you study architecture, I think it's for fashion and um, it, it's so much related. I live in Italy for 20, almost more than 20 years. And I always love the one sentence said, you know, every road toward Rome, you never know. So when I studied all this different universe, different discipline, different languages, I never thought I would be in the art world to own a gallery or to be art consultant, to be art advisor to, I think that it's the most important to do what you love and what you're passionate with and you are naturally do well, you effortlessly do well. But at the same time, more than ever in this world, all the disciplines are crossed. You just do your best. And I think 
there's a way that will lead you. Just follow your heart. And I, I think that when I, uh, uh, you know, in art business and uh, I sell, uh, you know, promote artists and, and I'm now I'm doing writing a book and working with the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, museums, companies, I realized that my, my knowledge as a journal, as journalist, as in the fashion world, as a historian, as you know, as as even as a lecturer, is all um, how to say all glue into one, help in, me in a different perspective. So, Yuyang, I think you did. A, you know, I, I really understand. I share with you a thought, and thank you for sharing. And I, I, I have been doing like what you. What you thought, and I, I think I'm still doing that, and never stop dreaming. <laughs> That's a beautiful thought. I just wanted to throw something else, and uh, and that is to say that um, uh, another character from from Italy, uh, uh, who also is in her own way maybe a kind of Marco Polo in some senses, is is Paola Antonelli, who is the curator of the Museum of uh, of Arch Architecture and Design in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And Paola actually is interesting because. Um, uh, she kind of she looks towards technology, and she's I mean she's interested in kind of the whole world of someone like Neri Oxman, especially who is also a kind of crossover figure in many ways. And and Paolo kind of takes this view that kind of technology is is in any case it's it's kind of almost revealing the possibility. I mean, Yu Yang's talking about you know uh, 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 fashion and so on, and uh, she was part of a workshop that I did in in Shanghai in, in Tongji um, on three D printed body architecture, where we basically this was with Ben Asferari, we were, we, were, we were deliberately taking this sort of line that actually this world of three D printed fashion, much of which had been which had been done by architects. I mean, on, on behalf of Iris van Herpen and so on, but it was opening up the path or revealing the fact that actually architecture never was in a sense. Um, um, uh, so separate from the other disciplines. Paolo Antonelli has this kind of view that kind of like architecture is just one aspect of, de of design, almost within a spectrum. It's one kind of color, as it were. And, you know, and I think going back to the Renaissance, of course, I mean, that was the case, right? I mean, you were kind of, we're in a kind of new Romantic Renaissance moment where, you know, Alberti was you know, an architect and a sculptor and a kind of a, an artist. And he wrote a books about mathematics and, and sociology and mythology and so on and so on. And also someone instrumental in the whole sort of uh, uh, language, kind of cultural, uh, you know, bringing in the Italian language and so on. So I think there's that in some ways we're in a kind of new Renaissance moment in some senses right. with this opening up and um, uh, um, from maybe the kind of artificial compartmentalization that, that happened uh, as, a, as a result of the discipline. I mean, you know, most of us were kind of had a broad range of interests and had to select one from a menu of options and we chose architecture, but maybe we could have done something yeah. else. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I still love that my favorite jewelry is a Zaha design for Bulgari and the, the ring called the Zero. zero, zero. I just love this architecturally design so different from the rest, all the jewelry designs. And, uh, and I remember the first time I visited uh, Azaha, did this, this, you know, the office in, in, in London and, the, you know, the, and I saw the, the Patrick well, it's uh, the shoes and, 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 and the dress and, and the furnitures. I think, you know, I see my Chinese uh, young designers use the 3D and, and the, 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 the cutting is now no more as, as a Versace learn from his uh, Mother Fran Francesca, you know, all this, you know, ancient craftsmanship, you know, the scissors, but everything was computerized, you know, the, today in the, in the, in the fashion, uh, fashion college, you no know, matter in the San Martin in London or in the person in New York or in Shanghai in Rafael, it's everything is connected, you know, architecture in the body. You know, I remember the first time I wore the white shirts of Gianfranco Fele, I felt it's like in the palazzo. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the shoulders, the white shirt of Frank, Gianfranco Fele was, we call them architecture of the white shirt. So I think that it's exactly what Neil said. It's, it's just, um, you know, the discipline that in, in the past time you limited your choice of your profession. But in, as a renaissance of today, I think it's really interdisciplined. You can be what you want to be and you can extend your capacity as much as you want. It's just keep on dreaming and creative, to be creative. I, I was, yeah, I was, I was just thinking about um, uh, again New York. I mean, Rem Kohlhaas and his amazing way of. I mean, he he brought alive um, New York in some ways, the way that uh, 
um, Jenny Versace. Actually, he brought alive Miami in some sense. And I, 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 one thing I love is this one particular image that he shows of the. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a ball of called a fête moderne ball, and it's a picture of, of these architects dressed up as their buildings. They literally are dressed up as their buildings, and and William Van Allen is dressed up as the Chrysler Building. And you, you kind of think in some ways that that you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I think these distinctions between different sort of disciplines are kind of. I mean, I, I, I always feel like, you know, if you have this creative impulse to be an architect, you know, there are many other uh, parallel domains in which one can operate anyway. I mean, we get, I mean, Rem himself was a, a filmmaker. Oh, sorry, it was, yeah, he was a filmmaker. He was a journalist turned architect. And you, you find all these other, uh, um, other kind of crossover sort of things that, uh, especially you know, architects often go into other industries anyway, into the space industry, into the into the um, in, into the kind of fashion world and so on. And I think there are many examples of of, of it's almost like it's a sensibility that could be displaced into other arenas. Um, I also I was fascinated, and the figure one figure that fascinates me is partly because I like his wine is 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 Coppola, um, Francis Ford Coppola, who was a filmmaker who then became a kind of a, a winemaker, and yeah. it's almost like it's it's the sensibility there's a common sensibility that could be deployed in in many other arenas and i think there's a kind of crossover there anyway but that's that's my own personal viewpoint that's great mm -hmm. i think i think also uh Ma Ching Yung, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, Ching Yung Ma, who was was the dean at uh, USC. He's the kind of, and he was the one actually who used to go to the Dong Hu Hotel, put me onto the Dong Hu Hotel, and he um, he's now become a, largely a winemaker, also an architect and things. So we we have this kind of uh, transition between these different disciplines. Uh, I'd like to encourage a few more questions before we we wrapped up. Any. I know that there are always some questions that people want to ask and they're embarrassed to ask, but I, I just would encourage you to go forward and yeah. Philippe, you want to? Uh, no, it's, it's super interesting, but I don't have specific questions. No, I think this. I just want to pick up on something because actually, you know, it was Philippe is awesome. It was always great at coming up with ideas and seeing things in a novel aspect, and he kind of had a fascination with um, with Miami without having going to gone to a Miami. It's a kind of interesting kind of question. Um, uh, and he he uh, as as maybe the archetypal um, uh, a kind of model that maybe the rest of the world might sort of follow in some sort of way, and and. I guess that's the thing that I'm what really kind of um, fascinates me about this. What I'm beginning to uncover when you go through this kind of B side view of Miami, you, you get this other sort of alternative view about how it has this kind of potential to yet to be realized, and it, it requires these pioneers to kind of open up the thing of, of of being a kind of model of of, of the, the future. And, and one thing that Philippe was saying is, you know, it's, it's actually it's it, Dubai has something like this, but no, there's nothing. There's it's not quite the same. And Miami's got something better than that. And I I agree in some ways. And it's you know also the, I mean the Las Vegas thing, which I find in many ways tawdry. Um, um, it's kind of you know, it's it's also a form of, form of escapism in some way, but there's something special about Miami in, in some ways that I don't know. I mean, I I I could see it catching on as as being, um, and of course it, you know it could catch on too much. I mean, the problem about Silicon Beach, frankly, um, where I am now, uh, is that you know it, it, when I mean Snapchat took off here, and it's literally about 150, 80 meters from where I I. I I live, Snapchat was born, and the problem was it took over everything in Venice Beach, and everybody came out and protested to get kick out, kick uh, Snapchat out of Venice, and so on. And we've got right next door, um, behind in some way, we've got uh, uh, Google um, in this geary building with his binoculars. It's super bizarre, and so on. But you know, I I I do think that you know that we can now see a possibility. We, we've been kind of kicked out of our familiar routine by by COVID, and and there are new forms of practice emerging, uh, which maybe mean that kind of the the the, the I always say the, the problem about places is that when you can be anywhere, it doesn't mean places unimportant. It means it's vitally important. So I could see Miami having a, a kind of um, uh, you know realizing its potential and, and uh, as as well as maybe a model of, of the play of the world of world to come in some ways. You know, I I am very familiar with Dubai because I go I, I, I you know I go to 
uh, Dubai since the first edition, and I'm very interested in the, you know, I, uh, in the last two years, I went to uh, Abu Dhabi, and I really love the Louvre of Abu Dhabi, and it's amazing music architecture, and, uh, and is the new concept of the museum of civilization is not just by the, 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 the flow of time, but the, by the themes. And this is really interesting. In the same room, you're from a Japan Meiji period, you see the Ming Dynasty, then you see what's going on in the Renaissance in one room. So I was like, you know, interested. I think it's interesting you, you, you mentioned about Dubai and Miami. I think if you are described with the Yin Yang philosophy, I, I I feel that Dubai is very young, is a masculine, and uh, Miami is a in energy is a feminine and this kind of you know I think the water make a difference you know of course in Dubai but this this kind of wave this temperature the humidity the tropical but in authentic way the, it, it's it's something that really um, have this um, um, as you mentioned very well the, in the in the this presentation is the the warm of the mother you feel even you feel you 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 know you're running around the beach your neck but it's kind of a protection you feel the warm and humidity you you're back to the warm of, of the of the uh, of your mother so there is kind of a feminine uh, uh, kind of a, a, a nature power energy in miami compared with dubai or other you know city with on the beach yeah, maybe I just could pick up on that because I just, I, I mean, I don't want to go too far in this direction, but I, I just think the idea of a aesthetic cocoon is a sort of beautiful thing. And I, you know, one thing I'd say is that the, the womb, according to Freud, was the first architecture that we experience, you know, and it is a form of paradise because, you know, we're kept warm by the mother, we're fed by the mother and so on. And for Freud, it's when we're kind of cast out from this kind of paradise. This is the crisis. If it's cold out there, we have to feed ourselves, we have to go and do all this, you know, and and, and the, the concept that Freud has is, is that, you know, uh, from then on, it's kind of everything is predicated on this regressive compulsion to return to the to the nirvana of the womb, and it's the kind of he describes it as a nirvana as a kind of paradise thing. And I just think that kind of when that when you the, the concepts that we have of paradise of you know everything being plentiful and in some ways and and and, and I, I just I kind of see that here in some way. I, I think it's a very evocative sort of a model and, and you know how how architecture can be seen as this kind of cocoon in some ways. I I think and and, and the, the importance being I guess. That, and beyond everything else, it's actually it's the role of aesthetics of design itself that allows us to kind of connect in some way. It's not just simply about nostalgia of something that something's cozy, but actually design itself can give us this kind of connection. And, and, and that's, I think, why design has become so important, increasingly important in some ways in Miami as part of that formulation. Exactly. So I wish to see everybody soon in Miami. Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, we, it's, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> we want to be there. Eleanor's there giving us, making it worse for us. Maybe, I don't, you know, one thing, can you just go and turn your, your laptop around so we can see the ocean? Oh, uh, look at that. Look at that. That's made it absolutely worse. You know, um, you know yeah. and I, I, you know, while I am by the beach here, um, uh, uh, I have to wear a wetsuit to go. Uh, yesterday I went out surfing and I, it was a, a shot of cold water came in from my wetsuit twice and I thought, oh, it's cold out here. No. So anyway, we, we look forward very oh, much to... It's really the best time from the, I could say from October to uh, March, it's just the paradise on earth. It's really nice. Um, and uh, you know, normally, at the, if there's no COVID, and that's this period is also our culture season. All the operas, all the ballets, all the concert from the top of Cleveland and to uh, to the um, to to uh, I say from Chicago uh, from uh, um, uh, symphony to ballet from New York. So this really because there's so many people from Europe, from New York and Canada, Canadian here. So this really the best time in Miami is from, and of course, our bars the last week of November, the first week. And then before, after that is the boat shows, the Miami, the food wine festivals, all these Miami film festivals. So it's really a very interesting period in Miami. And uh, is, this is now actually, if this, you know, without the COVID, but I'm, 
I wish you come back and uh, now you come back. Anybody come to visit us. It's, yeah. I will be welcome you and maybe we could finally not talking through Zoom and have a nice, nice a coffee on the Ocean Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's 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 that, that we look forward to that. Um, no, I was just just one, just one final thought. Maybe we can wrap up. But I was just I was thinking actually we had a, a session uh, two weeks ago with um, uh, Colin Ford, who actually in, I don't know if you know his work in choral morphologic, but it's exquisite in many ways. Um, and he's almost quintessentially also Miami because he's discovered this choral that then becomes part of the art, art Basel art world. And the, what is interesting about it is the colors, the colors. I mean, the ocean out there is this exquisite kind of blue anyway, but he picks up on the colors of, 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 the, of the coral, which actually is, they're very Gianni Versace, those colors. They are really kind of vibrant and uh, um, uh, in many ways. Um, yeah, yeah. No, we, uh, we, uh, we know in Miami, we have all the way to Key West, as with Hemingway, the wet Key West is just amazing. Uh, and it's not very far from Cuba, actually, and there's the point. But on the from Miami to drive to Key West is the most spectacular romantic drive ever. I think that we should do it with your students and together. This is really amazing. But near the uh, uh, Miami, we call the Key Lago, where they have all these kind of a natural reserve, the natural park, and you can dive and snorkeling there. And you saw the Johnny Versace color actually around with the fish. It's due today, even today I go there in the, in, in the natural park and you could see the color. What's it, now? And it, without wetsuits, now. <laughs> without wetsuits. <laughs> so it's really, uh, I know there's so much, uh, you know, have, you know uh, of course in Miami Beach, but I think beyond the Miami. And uh, I just mentioned with Ellen about the Miami, you know, Palm Beach, and you go to all the keys, you, you, you're swimming with the dolphins and you go to the Key West. It's, it's just like kind of laid back in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the movies or, and the Hemingway still, you know, the, the soul is hunting there with all the cats still around run, run at his garden. So it is a lot of to do. It's really amazing, uh, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just great. And, uh, to um, I think that you know have opportunity for all of you to come to visit Miami, and maybe live here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, anyway, I, let's let's. Um, are there any final questions from the group? Um, yeah. I'm going to show the beach, so now I'm going to jump in the beach. <laughs> I, and yeah, I have us, especially for anybody who's, is, 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 I mean, anyone in London, I, I can see why Zaha was attracted to the place. Um, well, let's let's wrap it up. But I, I, I mean, I'm just wondering, speculating about the future. You know, I think what what I, I think your life is actually as part of what is interesting to me, Miami, is, is Miami Beach, the personalities that go there and why they're attracted there and how they feed into the kind of culture of, of, of Miami Beach. And I think maybe as a kind of a pioneer in many ways, I mean, an incredible pioneer for Chinese culture, maybe we'll see um, Miami Beach, Beach becoming very popular with the, with the Chinese, especially because it seems that the, the Chinese New Year coincides with the worst weather in Beijing and the best weather in, in Miami Beach. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, let's let's wrap things up at this point. I'd just like to thank you for this astonishing, um, astonishingly rich thing, a very provocative discussion. Um, and uh, um, let's let to be continued. I mean, we look forward next year to being actually in Miami Beach and and and, and seeing what it's like and things. And uh, so um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for all the kind of questions out there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. me. And thank you for um, really wonderful uh, discussions and to meet you. And uh, hopefully I will see you here on the beach. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. Have nice thank you very day. much. Send you a lot of from Miami and jump in the ocean with the, all of you in my heart. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. I see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for having me. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.